Yeah, now this there? was terribly important to Paddy. This was hugely important to him because to him, this was evidence of the Europe that was, that had been, he hoped, temporarily disrupted by this horrible thing called, you know, National Socialism. But they are in a hideout. There's lots of discussion about where, because actually sometimes Paddy says one thing, sometimes he says it's another. But anyway, they're in this hideout and it's very, very cold. It's April, April of 1944. And then as dawn rises, they can see Mount Ida ahead. And the general starts to quote a sonnet of Horace, which is about Mount Sorati. And as luck would have it, this is one that Paddy is very fond of and has, in fact, translated at school, so he knows it by heart. So the German general, General Kreiper, sort of peters out after about four lines. And Paddy carries on the rest of the poem. And the general listens and then turns to him and says, Ach so, Herr Major. And that, for Paddy, was a moment when they connected to a Europe that was far older, you know, a cultural Europe that was actually the bedrock of civilization, really. And at that moment, all of the war was forgotten and they were back in that place where that culture existed still. Hello and welcome to the pod. This week I'm talking with Artemis Cooper about Patrick Lee Fermer, autodidact, traveller, writer and war hero. I've been an admirer of his since as a schoolboy I watched Ill Met by Moonlight starring Dirk Bogart, the film of Paddy's secret operation when Greek and British troops kidnapped a German general on the island of Crete. And so that was Artemis talking about the general and Paddy there. I then read his wonderful books which take you to a pre-war Europe that no longer exists. He wrote a trilogy of a two-year walk from Holland to Constantinople and then further books on Greece, the country he loved and where he lived for many years. There are plenty of links in the show notes for books and videos of Paddy. Please like, review and all that business and please do get in touch. I'm at history at aspectsofhistory.com but until then I'm going to hand you over to myself talking with Artemis Cooper on Patrick Lee Fermer. <laughs> Artemis, welcome. It's such a pleasure to have you on to talk about Patrick Lee Fermer, but thank you. It's a huge pleasure to be here. Well, as I was just saying before recording, this is very exciting for me because I'm a huge admirer, both of you, you, your book. Uh, I've also got Cairo during the war due to be delivered. So your <laughs> biography of Paddy Lee Fermer is just fantastic. And also Paddy Lee Fermer himself in, is fantastic, but there are Oh, Listeners yes. of mine, I suspect you might not be familiar with him. So we'll, we'll, we'll kind of run through his life. But if I were to ask you, to me, he's a sort of, sort of irrepressible character who is led. I mean, your the subtitle of your biography is An Adventure. I think that rather sums it up well. I mean, but for some of those listeners, the very few maybe who, who aren't familiar with him, how would you best describe Paddy before we get going into, into what he got up to in his life? Yeah, I think there's sort of two parts of him. The first is that he always and forever wanted to be a writer. So that was definitely what, what he was going to do. And he always wanted to travel. Very early on, at age about 18, he gets this idea that, you know, he's he's been a failure so far. He has sort of, his parents are split up. He's pretty unhappy. He failed it was called school certificate in those days. He doesn't want a job. He's got a super successful father who's a geologist in India who wants him to become a professional and choose a career and become a doctor or a lawyer or frankly anything, but just sort of not a bum. And all Paddy really wants to do is to write, but he knows he's got nothing to write about, so he'd better travel. So he decides to walk, aged 18, in 1933, from the Hook of Holland to the city he always called Constantinople. And that's going to give him the first thing to write about. And it's actually, as he described it, 
the first independent decision of my life and also the most sensible one. And it set the course. Yes, that really did change his life because he reading his life as he led it, as you've written about it, he didn't live a kind of, it's I hesitate to say normal <laughs> lifestyle, but he's traveling everywhere. He's never, he doesn't sort of, he sort of wherever he lays his hat, that's his home. Yes, he's jolly lucky somewhere in the places where he's allowed to hang up his hat on a hat stand. But uh, I think he's very good. He's First of all, he's a brilliant communicator. He loves talking. He loves talking to people. And I think it makes him instantly, he always wants to be with people. And whether they are peasants on the road or gypsies who he meets at night or grand people, he gets on with them all somehow. He somehow just sort of rises effortlessly like a little bubble of champagne into whatever social situation uh, you put him into. And an incredible gift for languages. Again, I think that's part of uh, the desire to communicate. The person I know who speaks most languages, I said to him, how come, how come you can do all this? And he said, I just want to talk to people. And that's what I think it boils down to, perhaps a certain confidence, um, a kind of ease, but also just sort of really, really wanting to know what other people are doing, what makes them tick, you know, what, what they do in life, uh, what they think about things. It's all grist to the mill. And did that come from, because he had a, quite an unusual very early childhood where he I think he writes about he was led off at any kind of lead and was running around was it in Northamptonshire he was at Northamptonshire yes I think um, his mother at that stage she hadn't split up from his father yet and they were living in India because his father is a geologist working on the survey of India and so she comes back to England to have her baby in about whatever it is 19 well, it must be when he's born in 1911 it must be later than 1911. 1915, isn't it? It's 1915. I'm so sorry. So by the time she has the baby, the war is full blown and she wants to get back to India where she's left her daughter. And she thinks that Northamptonshire is going to be the safest place for Paddy. Apart from anything else, it's pretty much bang in the middle of England. She thinks that probably it's safe from air attack or sea attack or whatever. And she leaves him. We don't really know very much about them. They're called Mr. and Mrs. Martin, and they live in Northamptonshire in the village of Weedenbeck. And there he spends the first sort of four or five years of his life just running around completely free, no education, nothing to do except sort of play, grow up with the village kids. Uh, he's expelled from various schools. And I know we're jumping around a bit, so I hope yeah. the listeners can um, forgive me. But um, he's thrown out of schools. He does. I think the thing to, the thing really is that this sort of, this first four years of absolute freedom made him rather unmanageable. Plus the fact that I think his, his parents are splitting up. He's always very much of a mummy's boy as opposed to his sister who's daddy's girl. But mummy is a very extraordinary person. And she was one of those women who, had she been born a few years later, she could have done something with all the talents that were that were just roiling around in, inside her. But she never really had. She married too young and it was a not a particularly happy marriage. And she was enormously creative. She loved plays. She taught him to read. So she's a huge, creative, inspirational person for him on one hand but on the other she blows cotton cold you never know where you are with her you know one one time she'll be hugely loving and warm and on the other she'll leave you at school for the holidays because she wants to go off with whatever the one thing that is extraordinary about paddy is he doesn't have a sort of conventional education for a for such an intellect no. the day he doesn't go to university for example no, I think the trouble was his father was always trying to turn him into a scientist. And so Paddy was expelled from a number of schools, but he finally ends up at the King's School, Canterbury, which I think actually 
served him very well. And it was a pity he got expelled from that. He was expelled at the age of about 16 for holding hands with the greengrocer's daughter, which was obviously practically a custodial offence as far as the school was concerned, uh, or the very opposite of custodial. They threw him out. But I have a nasty feeling that it was probably the straw that broke the camel's back because if anybody was, you know, climbing up the roof of the cathedral or smoking outside the window or whatever it was, it was bound to be Lee Firma. And he was always getting into trouble. So I think this was just a good opportunity to get rid of him. Uh, headmasters tend to really often they hit the nail on the head when they sum up a pupil in in a sentence and and i think his headmaster i've forgotten exactly what he says but he says he's he's quite brilliant but completely unmanageable or something yeah that's right actually i think that might have been his brigade of guards training and i think the guy who's sort of the the commander of the training camp says this man has many talents that the war ought to be able to use but he will never make a good regimental officer Yes, we shall certainly get to his uh, his wartime years. And but okay, so having read the two books, which we're jumping around a bit, were written many years later. A time of gifts and between the woods and the water. That's written in his fifties and sixties, even though he was only uh, in his late teens, early twenties when he did the walk. But during that walk, he meets this quite wonderful woman, Balasha, in Romania. And... Yeah, he's sort of at the end of the walk by then. He's been to, uh, he's been to Constantinople, where he spent New Year and most of January, nineteen thirty-four, and then he comes back to Greece because, in fact, Greece is the place that has always held his imagination. And when he was at school, his father said, "You can't do." ancient Greek. Latin, of course, was compulsory. You can't do ancient Greek until you get better at maths. Well, unfortunately, he never did. He never did get better at maths. So he could, he didn't, he was never allowed to take ancient Greek. Such is the madness of parents, I'm afraid, sometimes. Yeah, well, that's bordering on trial cruelty. Uh, Yeah, well, stuff happens. Yes, it does. It does. In a funny way, if he'd been allowed to, perhaps Greece wouldn't have taken on that extraordinary, you know, the the kingdom in the sky somehow that it became. Yeah. Was that always the magnet for his... I know Constantinople was the destination. Uh, Well, it was the destination because it sounds so fantastic. Yeah. I mean, let's face it, if you say you're going to go from the Hook of Holland to Athens, it doesn't sound quite so good, does it? But to Constantinople, boom, boom, clash of symbols. It's fantastic. Yeah. So it's a great place. And it's the gates of Asia. You know, you really have crossed Europe if you get there. So I think he was always determined to get there. But having got there... He wanted to then explore Greece, and it's when he got to Athens. By now, he's not walking anymore. He's taken a bus to Athens, having spent some time on Mount Athos, the the holy mountain, with the monks. And there he's learned a bit of Greek. Anyway, he gets to Athens, and that's where he meets Balasha Kontakusen, and they fall in love. And she is the first great love of his life. She's 12 years older, so she's in her 30s by then. She's already got one sort of failed marriage behind her, but she never divorced her husband. This is actually rather an important point for later. And anyway, they fall in love and they spend between 1934 and the outbreak of war, 1939, together. And they're going, they're they're mostly either in London or in uh, Romania. In Romania, he picks up Romanian. He absolutely loves the the life there. Balasha and her family live on a great big estate in the northeast of Romania. And it's a place where money hardly ever comes in because it's an enormous estate. Everybody, so they've got servants. They've got a wonderful sort of crumbly house full of antiquities, full of books, and but they're living very simply and there's no kind of cash exchange everything you eat comes from the forest or the the woods 
and there are people who do the butchering people who do the cleaning people they're not paid anything but it's a sort of economy that works on a kind of quid pro quo and he loved that he loved all the the singing he loved the reading this was actually the university he never went to because balasha was fabulously well read and uh, her family's library included all the great sort of English and French classics, which she'd never really had a chance to read. And so these years are hugely important. He's also, funnily enough, going back to visit the people he stayed with during that great walk. So he becomes more friends with them. You know, he really does get involved with them, which is why when the Second World War comes, followed by communism, which just destroys this world that he has known, the pre-war Europe, that he eulogises, really, in his books. Although, uh, curiously, I mean, at the end of the First World War, Europe had changed beyond imagining. You know, empires had crumbled. New countries had sprung up from the ruins. You know, there were wars in the making, even if they hadn't sort of, you know, there were huge tensions, industrialization, blah, blah, blah. And yet you read those books and it's a Europe that somehow suspended somewhere between imagination and memory. But, but that's why they're so wonderful. Mm. And I know that there are some who are critical of particularly travelling through Germany and Paddy not really dealing with the sort of Nazi question. I always think if you want to find out about that, you can. Well, That's... quite. And actually, he does try and do I mean, he says, I had, I, have con I had conversations. He rolls them all up into one conversation. Uh, but he hates the whole idea of Nazi Germany and he doesn't want to think about it taking over he wants to live wants to live in the past basically but it's a past of his own creation yeah exactly that is what's um so extraordinary about it actually this amazing imagination okay the war breaks out and it i mean i guess it disrupted so many lives um but in you know yeah. for, for paddy he knows he has to return you know he has oh, he that... doesn't have to oh no he really really wants to go and Balasha knows it, and she writes him a letter sort of saying, you know, I knew, she hears, hears the news, she's coming back from somewhere by herself, she hears the news on the car radio, and she says, in that moment, I knew you were going to go. And she said, I knew that I couldn't hold on to you. And Paddy, I think, is, you know, he's been sort of slightly drifting. He's tried to write up this great walk, but, you know, he's not sounding like Robert Barrett. He's not sounding like Norman Douglas. He's not sounding like the people he really admires. And so um, he's very dissatisfied. And so the war is this wonderful, rather romantic opportunity to pitch yourself against something big, be part of something really important. And he's very keen to join the Irish Guards. Mm. Now, my father very. was in the Irish Guards, so... Ah, uh, yeah. This is a great claim to fame that my father and the regiment has. But I mean, whilst he trains, is it Caterham that he trains at? Well, he trains in the guard. Oh, sorry, in the in the guards brigade sort of depot. But the point is, when you you do your basic training, and then uh, you you're allowed to say which regiment of the guards you want to join, and very and if you've got connections with the Irish Guards or with the Scots Guards or you know. You can sort of say, please, uh, I'd really like to join. But the trouble was he had to be back squatted because he was very ill in the middle of his training. And then when that means that by the time he'd finished his training properly, the Irish guards didn't have a place for him. And Paddy's got to earn some money. So he can't afford to hang around waiting until the Irish guards have a place for him. And so the only people who are offering him a job are the intelligence corps. And they are very interested in the fact that he speaks German and Romanian and, and indeed Greek by now, Demotic. And in fact, a much better fit, I think. And perhaps the commanding officer of the Irish Guards, who was a very sympathetic guy, had seen that remark about him perhaps not making the ideal regimental officer. And probably thought that intelligence was a far better fit. In fact, that was right. 
the army are very, very good at sorting people and knowing what makes them tick and how they can use them. Well, my father told me a story, and this is probably apocryphal, and you can perhaps explode this myth, that he, during his training, a fellow recruit was being shouted at by the regimental sergeant major for being a, a stupid Irish bastard or something like that, you know. Yeah. And so Paddy, I, I, I don't believe this, but Paddy apparently misbehaved so that he would be shouted at and he downed his weapons and said, right, I'm, I'm not doing anything. And he was put in the brig and then was had up before the commandant or whoever, who said to him, well, what's all this? You've refused to obey the RSM. And he said, well, he called me an Irish bastard and I'm here voluntarily. And if you won't, you know, if, if you won't be a little bit nicer to me and not refer to my Irishness, then I'm going to go home. There are so many things wrong with that. I, I exactly. Can't... I'm afraid I'm afraid there are, partly because also Paddy's Irishness is distinctly questionable. And so while I can see that he would have had sympathy for anybody who was being bawled out, I imagine that he was bawled out by the RSM quite frequently. But I don't in an in an Irish guards regiment, you have an RSM saying that? I mean, of course you would call you all kinds of absolutely unrepeatable things. But I don't think a sort of Irish git would be one of them, would it? Well, I think it's. I think the RSM is meant to be from some another regiment, like oh, he is, is he? Oh, okay, something. right, okay. Well, then perhaps he um, did even... call a lot of them Irish kids. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> but even so, I would have thought the commandant would have had the. Anyway, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but uh, the yeah, I, would have had I, his I don't file really he wasn't Irish. I don't really believe it, and also Paddy's Irish connection. I've never been able to follow through. I, I, I'm sure there is one. But the trouble is, is that the archives were all destroyed, I'm afraid, by the British when they destroyed the Dublin archives in whatever it was, 1922. And unless you went round every single village in Ireland looking at the parish registers, I, I, I don't know. If, I mean, and, and that side of his family who are called Ambler, they've been doing a huge amount of work for years and even they can't make this connection. It was an invention of his mother's, I think. Ah, oh, ah. Oh. Because, you see, his, his mother's family were called Ambler, but she always referred to herself as Taff Ambler because she wanted to get back to the Viscount's Taff of Sligo or wherever it was. And she was determined to give herself... I mean, for Eileen uh, Firmer, as she became his mother, two names were always better than one. So his father is Sir Lewis Firmer, but his mother tacked on the Lee, you know, just because it sounds grander. Well, she's absolutely right. Double-barreled names. It does. Do, do sound <laughs> Well, the intelligence corps is is the perfect place for him, really. And so I guess the Germans, I know I'm skipping around here, but the Germans invade Greece. and They do, in 41. By this stage, Paddy is a liaison officer with the Greek army. So working liaison work between the British and Greek armies. The intelligence corps seem to have a whole load of classicists wandering around Greece. It's a very romantic Vision And of course, one thinks of Byron, particularly. Yeah, those classicists are the people who've actually done the footwork or walked around and, you know, uh, they were doing other stuff, obviously. They weren't looking, looking, you know, trying to fight a war. But my God, they knew the terrain in certain parts of, of Greece. So they were the automatic go to people. If you want people on the ground who, first of all, know, I mean, they will know it in patches. They won't know all of Greece. But they will know certain areas very well where they've worked as scholars or whatever, and they will know the local people. So they're a very good uh, starting point, if you like. I remember in the book again that uh, NGL Hammond, who I studied at university, uh, who's a, a specialist on Macedonia and Alexander, he, that's where he was. That's for, where for he was, time. exactly. Yeah, yes, I, yes. I love and, all that. And uh, yeah, and of course he ends up, I think, I think he's the one who, uh, who does the boats, doesn't he? Isn't he on the boat service at one point? Yes. Oh, right. He gets a little kaikis and oh, um, yes, yes, fits yes, yes, them yes, out yes, yes. for the Navy and, and sort of runs, I don't know, guns, whatever anybody else needs or people, you know, around the islands and stuff. I mean, if I had known that when I was reading his many great books whilst at university, I would have read them. I would have been a lot more motivated to read them, I think. Yeah, I know, <laughs> but there we are. I was I was thinking about this because, okay, we're going to talk about a very exciting operation that Paddy, um, mm -hmm. uh, which is immortalised on screen with <laughs> yes. um, 
Ill Met by Moonlight, which actually wasn't written by him. It was written by his... his... By the second in command, yeah, yes. Billy Moss. Actually, I watched the film again. It's... I watch it Tone first. Curly. <laughs> it's not as yeah, it's not as good as I first remember watching it. No, I mean it's very much of its date. And the thing was that when it was made in 1956, it was that time of the Cyprus crisis, so they weren't allowed to film in Greece. So in fact, that whole film, the mountain scenes, are all done in the Alp Maritime. It's probably okay. We should talk about what happened. Right. And okay. this is Paddy's idea as well. Uh, is it not? After a fashion, I mean, uh, it's it's an idea that's been mooted. It is basically his idea. It has been mooted before. But anyway, he, at the time of the uh, Italian surrender, uh, an Italian general approaches him and says, will you get me out? I want to carry on fighting. And I have a feeling that the Germans are just going to take over all our weapons and we won't have a chance. And I'll just end up, you know, for the rest of the war as a prisoner of war in a German camp. And I don't want to do that. So can you get me out? So Paddy does, gets him out, and then accidentally he accompanies the Italian general onto the launch that's come to collect him because all this has been sort of organised through Cairo where the the central headquarters of SOE are, the Special Operations Executive, of which Paddy is now a part. And uh, so all that's been organised. But Paddy, by accident, he didn't mean to, the weather suddenly got rough when he was on the boat having taken the general on board and he has to go back to Cairo too and when he's in Cairo for a period of completely unlooked for R&R &R, he thinks well we've taken an Italian general why don't we take a German general and why don't we take the most horrible German general of a lot who's called General Brower who has been responsible for some truly appalling atrocities on the island so this seems like a very good idea and he gets the go ahead and so Paddy puts together a team in Cairo and they're mostly Cretans who have got out of Crete, who've been trained by SOE. They are technically members of his Hellenic Majesty's forces. And there's two or three absolutely crucial ones there, in particular Manolis Patarakis, who's Cretan, and also George Tirakis and various others. And anyway, they, they get together this little gang. But the way the plan works is the general is going to be stopped in his car on his way back to his digs at the Villa Ariadne near Nosos. And therefore, he needs somebody, because Paddy can't drive terribly well. He never could. It was terrifying. I mean, you really don't want to be in a car with Paddy. Have William you been Stanley... in a car with Paddy? Uh, yes, I have. It wasn't that. It's, it's, but I mean, actually, more often I drove him. That was even more frightening because it was a bit like the Flintstones. You could see the, the road through the bottom of the car. But anyway, that's <laughs> sorry, I interrupted you. He had to have somebody who could pass for a German, and who was a good driver. And William Stanley Moss was fair, very tall, very much sort of you know looked looked the part, looked sort of very Germanic. And so he thought, yes, okay. And Paddy also knew that he was going to be far too busy as the operation went on, kind of, you know, the different stages of it and all the rest of it. He knew that he was going to be far too busy to write anything, whereas Billy's main job, once the driving was over, was going to be looking after the general. And so he was going to do the writing up. He was going to do that. Well, that was always set. Paddy was never going to write this operation up. Anyway, they get to Crete and Paddy jumps out of the aeroplane and... They're dropping, they're going to be dropping in a sort of stick formation, one chap after another, in a tiny bowl in the mountains. And Paddy drops first, shines the torch, it's all okay. In that moment, a huge wind gets up and a blizzard. And nobody else can be dropped that night. So the plane and the team, including Billy Moss and the Cretans, have to go back to Bari. And there they are stuck for seven weeks. And Paddy is in Crete, isolated. I mean, it's all right. He finds he finds SOE people around. But in those seven weeks, General Brower is promoted and sent to Hanya. So the whole point of getting a general who had made the lives of the Cretans pretty awful 
is out the window because there's no way they're going to be able to take him from Hanya, which is the German stronghold on the far western side of the island. And so the message goes back, do you want to abort? And a lot of people did want the mission aborted. A lot of people didn't actually want this to take place at all because we hadn't really gone into the, the reasons why it was given the go-ahead. But anyway, the people who matter think this, that actually it's it's going to give such a boost to morale to the Cretans if we capture a German general. It doesn't really matter which one. So we'll take the next one who comes along, the next one who's going to be the divisional commander in Heraklion. So uh, this is where the unfortunate General Kreiper comes in. He's been serving on the Eastern Front. And they and his superiors think, uh, well, you know, he he probably needs a bit of R and R, so uh, we'll put him on this nice, easy job after after Russia. No sooner has he got his legs under the desk, when one evening he's driving back in his car from his headquarters at to his to his villa, the Villa Ariadne, and he's kidnapped by Paddy and a group of Cretans, and William Stanley Moss. Now I'm saying a group of Cretans like this. This is actually an Anglo-Cretan operation. The Cretans are completely vital. It, nothing would have happened without them. And uh, they have done most of the lead work. They have organized the route. They are relying on uh, Cretan partisans in the mountains to give them shelter as they make their way across the island and down to the south coast. It's all planned by Cretans. And uh, anyway, they have, but the first part of it is once they've captured the general, they have to drive through the center of German controlled Heraklion, through 22 German uh, checkpoints. Paddy is in the passenger seat wearing the general's hat. Billy Moss has got the driver's cap on, and he's a beautiful driver. And the general, is in the footwell at the back being sort of sat on by three Cretans, including Manolis Patarakis and various others. And uh, anyway, so fine, they managed to get through. The general is already known for being quite impatient with the checkpoints. So in fact, what Billy Moss does is slow down as he gets to the checkpoint and then start speeding up. And Paddy's shouting out, get me a wagon! And so they quickly lift the barrier and let them through. And anyway, they finally manage to get through Heraklion. They leave the car on the north coast and then they walk overland from there to the south coast and get him off. Now, that takes several weeks and there are a number of very, very close run encounters. Well, they're not encounters, but they're, you know, evasions but the germans are swarming all over the island looking for the general although apparently he wasn't terribly popular and when the news came through to his headquarters apparently there was a stunned silence and then the next officer said well i think that calls for a round of champagne <laughs> well there's a moment that paddy and the general do make a connection then yeah now this there? was terribly important to paddy this was hugely important to him because to him, this was evidence of the Europe that was, that had been, he hoped, temporarily disrupted by this horrible thing called, you know, National Socialism. But they are in a hideout. There's lots of discussion about where, because actually Pat, sometimes Paddy says one thing, sometimes he says it's another. But anyway, they're in this hideout and it's very, very cold. It's April. April of 1944. And then as dawn rises, they can see Mount Ida ahead. And the general starts to quote a sonnet of Horace, which is about Mount Sorati. And as luck would have it, this is one that Paddy is very fond of and has in fact translated at school, so he knows it by heart. So the German general, General Kreiper, sort of peters out after about four lines. And Paddy carries on the rest of the poem. And the general listens and then turns to him and says, Ach so, Herr Major. And that 
for Paddy was a moment when they connected to a Europe that was far older, you know, a cultural Europe that was actually the bedrock of civilization, really. And that at, the, at that moment, all of the war was forgotten. And they were back in that place where that culture existed still. Going into the reasons for the kidnapping, mm. I mean, you've mentioned that it was a big morale booster. Is that partly because the, the Allies were going to invade Europe from the south through Italy as opposed to the promised original? Exactly. Promised so at first, I mean, the whole of SOEs after the German invasion and then the uh, the German occupation of the island, SOE start infiltrating and they connect with various capitans, they're called in the mountains, who have who are resistance partisans. You know, they've got their own little private armies, as it were. I mean, they're, and they're all working for the Allied cause and SOE is trying to keep them armed. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's quite hard because they don't want, the Cretans are always wanting to sort of go off and do damage to the Germans. So why not? You know, the Germans have overrun their homeland. And the SOE agents are always saying, so the, the Cretans always want more, more guns, more ammunition. The British are always trying to pull back, saying, well, look, keep your powder dry. Don't go off at half cock, you know, doing little operations that are only going to lead to civilian casualties and, and reprisals. Keep your powder dry because when the time is right, we are going to come through and we are going to sweep in through southern Europe. And, you know, it could well be Crete. Uh, that was what they allowed the Cretans to believe. But obviously, after the Allied landings in November 1942, that was all gone. And the Cretans felt very sidelined and betrayed. And so this was why this operation, it was thought, would give them such a boost to morale. And I think it did. I think it did. There are sort of quotations from people said, you know, after we heard that he'd been captured, we all stood a bit taller. And this is not for Paddy's first operation in Crete. By now, he's a very, very seasoned operator. He's worked in the west of the island. He's done this thing with the Italian General Carter. And so he's really a very seasoned operator. But even so, it's, it's a very tough operation when all the Germans, because that was another thing, cocking a snook at the Germans. All the Germans look pretty foolish for having let this happen. And so, although whatever they think of General Kreiper, they're, they're, they're doing their darndest to get him back. And Paddy is terrified of reprisals. He wanted this to be a completely bloodless operation. In fact, it's, it, sadly, it wasn't bloodless. The um, General Kreiper's driver was killed on the way, which was really, really not supposed to happen, but it did. So and there aren't tremendous... really reprisals, are there? It's not clear that, that any reprisals are down to the kidnapping of the general well you can read that two ways so there are no reprisals in the immediate aftermath however all the reprisals take place in august 1944 and if you go through cretan villages in the interior through the amari valley now you will see these tiny villages with huge marble war memorials and almost all that, you can't believe how many men lived in this village. Every one of them killed. And the date's always the same, August 1944. The reason for that was that was when the Germans were pulling out. They realised that they couldn't hold Crete for much longer. They were going to have to pull back. Um, Germany was by then, you know, fighting for its breath, really. So they had to, they had to get out. So they pulled back from east to west to their strong point in Hanya, from which they're going to eventually evacuate. Now, retreat in the face of the enemy is one of the hardest things you can do in good order. And you don't want to have a sort of bloodbath. You don't want it to look undignified. So best way to do that is to cow the entire population with reprisals. And so they dig up stuff from way back, including the Kriper operation. And they go through these villages in August 1944, just killing, really. 
And another reason for this is that the Germans, this is rather embarrassing, the Germans are beginning to suffer from desertions. And they don't want their men to think, oh, well, the Cretans really looked after the allied uh, stragglers and uh, people who were left behind uh, after 1941. They read, they, and they did, they made enormous networks of people handing the, the, the sort of waifs and strays of people who hadn't gone back to their units or whatever so that they could escape. Well, the Germans didn't want that sort of generosity from the Cretans for their own men. So what better way than to turn every one of their men into a looter and a killer? So that there's no way that the Cretans, even if that man is left behind for whatever reason, he's not going to get anything like the sort of cosy treatment that the Allies did in 1941. So, yes, there are uh, there is a, a particular announcement in the Cretan newspaper, which is German controlled. And it says why all the villages have been raised to the ground, why, you know, there's been a decimation of the male population, whatever it is. And yes, there are certain villages picked out because they gave aid and succor to the kidnappers. So, yeah, I don't think it was completely free by any means. No, but Paddy's a national hero in Greece. Mainly yes, but there operation. is also, yes, he is. Yes, but there at is, the same there time, is there is an else. ambivalence. There is a huge ambivalence in life. I remember um, walking through central Crete with, friends of mine and one old man saying to me was it really worth it to get one german general to freedom which was so, of no military significance to and it was of no it did not it did not bring the end of the war closer by a single second so you know there are there are definitely big criticisms you can make but i think at the same time you see very often these things you know human beings being what they are they go together so people are enormously proud of how well that operation was done. And at the same time, the reparations seem unforgivable. So the two go, I mean, who are you not forgiving? It's, you know, it's the Germans. But it, actually, yeah. even the Germans now have been forgiven. So you can you meet a great many of them in Crete now. In indeed, indeed. So how did Paddy look back on his time during the war as something, there's a temptation, I think, when reading some of his work, it was all great fun and all, all that kind of thing. But obviously... Uh, whose work are you reading? Well, I suppose, you know... You're reading maybe probably William Hollywood. Stanley Moss. Exactly, exactly, yes, yes. Yeah, that's the thing. And I think actually uh, he was very ambivalent, Paddy was very ambivalent about that book, very embarrassed by the way the general was treated in that book. He urged Billy Moss to change certain things. And Billy Moore said, no, it's a diary of a 22-year-old. Uh, that's how. That's who I was. That's that's the way it was. Uh, I'm not changing anything. Anyway, uh, I think it did cause great resentment. But you see, the funny thing was, I think Paddy always knew he was going to be a writer. So actually, he coped with the piece an awful lot better than many other SOE people who just didn't know what to do with it, who'd had a fabulous war and just didn't know what to do with the piece. But Paddy knew exactly what he wanted to do with the piece. And by now he's met another woman, Joan Ayres Munsell, who's going to many years later become his wife, but they're going to be together for the next, all the way through the 50s and 60s, 70s on. And Balasha, of course, now his first love is caught behind the Iron Curtain. And she never escapes and it's actually interesting. She could have got out of Romania any time she wanted because she was still married to a Spanish diplomat. They had not got a divorce because that would have wrecked his career. And so she was still officially uh, married to a Spanish diplomat and could have got out through diplomatic channels any time. But she chose to stay in Romania and chose to stay with her family, mm -hmm. her sister and her brother-in-law. It's Tragic when Paddy returns to see her after the war. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's a terribly sad. I, it's she... terribly sad. And I think he's totally unprepared for, you know, how she had, well, she was, she'd suffered so badly. And she, I think she was, she was looking very aged and yeah, as well one might. But he's such a positive character. It, he comes across that way. 
Oh, he was. Is, he was certainly was. Is there yeah. a lot of lot? Is there introspection about these tragedies that were that he did experience? Or oh did gosh, he yes. Take oh, no, I, no, I don't think you could take that. I mean, the very fact that he'd made that effort, which was a huge effort, because all right, you know, 1965, Romania was opening up, but you had to be careful. And, you know, the only way to get to Balasha was to get on the back of her niece's motorbike. I think her niece was working then in, in Bucharest. It was working in Bucharest. So, you know, one night uh, she gives him a lift to the little village of Puchoasa, little town more like, where they are staying. And they spend 24 hours together. They don't dare do any more. Yeah, he can't stay. I mean, them. He's not meant to stay more. He's than... not meant to yeah. stay. He can't. I mean, it, it's yeah. too dangerous. If the if the neighbours catch him, they are going to be accused of harbouring spies and God knows what. It's it's really dangerous. And so, but he spends twenty four hours there, and I think that was, uh, you know, I mean, he could have just given her, given the niece a few presents for them, and said, well, that's it. It's, you know, it's too difficult. But no, he does, and he keeps in touch with her, and Joan does as well. Uh, his wife. And they're always saying, you know, there's a place for you here. We can get you out. But she doesn't want to. She feels that, you know, she's sort of um, made her choice in life and that's it. It's very brave. He never abandoned her in any way. I mean, maybe he did when the when he started off at the war, you know, the beginning of the war. But what choice does he have? He's, he's going to go back and fight. And then the curtain comes down and life goes on. And, you know, I think she knew. She knew right from that time when she heard the declaration of war in the car that this was the end. You've only got to read that letter. We're running out of time because, I mean, I could speak to you forever about... There's so much not spoken about. I mean, you've mentioned Joan. She's... There aren't that many photographs of her, are there? Uh, no, there aren't. Uh, because Ironic, she was... given she's a photographer. Yes, absolutely. Uh, there are one or two, but she hated being photographed. She hated being in the limelight and she always kind of retreated. There's very little about her in his books, too, because she was the first editor and every mention of herself was sort of, you know, uh, cut out, really. So uh, she was in an intensely private woman. And at one point I, you know, I, I tried I asked Paddy, I said, would you try and get Joan to open up a bit? And so over lunch, he did. And then she suddenly said she was talking about some rather wonderful things uh, when she was in India. And suddenly she said, I can see what you're doing. I'm not going to go any further with this. And she just stopped there dead, you know, in mid-sentence. I should mention that as well as the biography, I mean, there was always this promised third book. And you can see in many interviews on YouTube, pained looks that, that Paddy gives when he's asked. Oh, about it's so it. horrible. It's so horrible. And yeah. the trouble is, while, while he was with Balasha that time in 1965, she gave him back the diary, the only surviving diary that he had from that time. All the others were lost. And it's this awful thing. He can't square the circle. He sounds so different in the diary to this wonderful sort of rather lyrical scholar gypsy that he's turned himself into in the first two books. So that last book, which I edited with Colin Thubra on The Broken Road, was in fact written before the other two. And when we published it, we we hardly had to do anything. There were several different versions of it, but, you know, it, it was very easy to put together. It's all his words. There's, there's only a little few linking passages and stuff like that, that you know, it, of us in italics, but that's it. It was all there. So what oh, was it so stopping so tragic. Him? It was, I think, first of all, that first thing which grew out of a magazine article, The Broken Road, it sounds very different to the other two books that were written later. It is more immediate. He feels anger. He feels impatience. He feels pain even, which he never does in those other two books. I remember some wonder, one review saying it's a relentlessly pleasant journey. Uh, but in that first book, there are tensions, there are frictions, and you feel it. And so it feels very different from that sort of pristine, you know, juggling between memory and imagination. It feels much more immediate, much more raw in a way. And it covers the very period, you know, from Orsova all the way through to Constantinople and the slight sort of 
damp squib that Constantinople, no, Constantinople wasn't a damp squib, but he gets there, and like so many people having done a great journey, what do you know? He finds out he's the same person he was when he started out and nothing's changed. So it's a, it's a, I think, a very interesting book. And when it came out after his death, I thought, God, are they, you know, what, what's, what are the reviews going to be like? Are, are people going to say, oh, it's not like the other two? But in fact, everybody adored it. He could have had that pleasure. He could have gone to his grave knowing that he completed that. Uh, it, it still kills me that he didn't that he didn't complete it, although it was already complete. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that because I, I mean, I look always look at a glass half full. So I thought, you know, to have those two, we have those two. Yeah. That, and, you know, we got the third, but, but we got the third. But having written those two, they're such a wonderful achievement. Oh, they that... are. They're, they're stunningly good. And also there's his other books, you know, Mani, Rumi. Uh, Mani is my about... favourite, I have to oh, say. Oh, Mani is so brilliant. Um, so, you know, he was, he had so much to offer, although he was the slowest writer in the world. And, you know, he, yeah, whenever he could be distracted, he was. Yeah, I, I've been reading his letters as well, which um, <laughs> are, ju are just. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. yeah. 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 I preferred is... writing letters. And begging forgiveness of his, his publisher every other letter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's wonderful. I okay. I, we're we're very nearly over. So and we've barely scratched the surface. But for listeners, if you want, you must buy the biography if this has tickled your interest because the, obviously there's a lot more that I've not even covered. But I wondered, I wanted to ask this. It's there are some people who are not enamoured with Paddy, and I mean I'm I would definitely not be in that group of people. But I was talking about Paddy to, to someone, a good friend of mine, the other day who is not particularly taken by him saying he's a bit too much of a peacock and um, appearing in London. I'm here and, and going to all these parties and things. Now that doesn't bother me at all. I mean, I would love to have met him at one of these parties, but one of one writer who is a, I'm a huge admirer of, I love his writing is Somerset Mormon. He didn't particularly like Paddy either. Is there a particular sort of person who didn't, really maybe an uh, an unromantic person someone who's a little bit too you know someone who is a little bit more of a um, realist who is not swayed by paddy's charm yeah i think there's probably quite a few people like that and i think he could come across as uh as very much sort of wanting to dominate the conversation or uh you know and he could go off onto these amazing riffs. So, yes. And I remember after I'd written the book, somebody came up to me in Hatchards and said, well, I read your book and I don't think I like Paddy. I think he's a scrounger and I think he's a womanizer and, and a show off. And yes, he was all those things. But I think he was also so much more. And there was a kind of generosity of spirit. Yes, he was a show off. Of course he was. But at the same time, he was so engaging. I remember, I don't know if we've got time for this, but the, the last time, not the last time, but I, I went to go and see him after Joan had died. And it was the first time I was going to be there on my own for about 10 days. And I was terrified because I thought, here's this man with so many stories. He knows everybody. He's been everywhere. Uh, he always wants to be entertained. Uh, you know, he's going to get so bored of me. And I was supposed to be writing his biography. You know, God, how's the time going to pass? And I really was scared. But anyway, the time passed and I found myself thinking on the plane as I went home. Oh, well, that went well, didn't it? You know, oh, what a lot of people I know. What a lot of books I've read. What a lot of funny stories I know. And actually, you know, it was his response. Every time I mentioned a book, he would say, oh, I must write that down. i got to order it tomorrow. And every time I told a joke, he would throw his head back. Sorry, I can see it now. Aww. And it was always, you know, he thought you were, it was just a completely brilliant story. And as you were in the lead up to it, John Betjeman describes this too. He leans forward like this, just waiting to hear what you're going to say next. And that was not sham. That was just complete involvement with whoever's there. It's just, you know his just responsiveness to anything and everybody. And I think that impressed me so much. And I realised on the plane, I thought, my God, you think that's you? It was him, you idiot, you know? And it was him. 
and he could just be such fun even if and he never made you feel bad he said god you haven't read hardy's the dynast oh my god what a treat you've got in store i think i've got a copy here you know so he never made you feel bad about your huge or my anyway huge lapses in you know ignorance of culture and history and god knows what else artemis you're being way too modest there but um <laughs> That, that's a lovely way to end this discussion on Paddy Lee Firma. So thank you so much. Um, well, it's been a huge I've pleasure. Been really a huge enjoyed pleasure. it. <laughs> Me um, too. Well, listeners, links are in the show notes. Uh, there is a, uh, I've put links to a number of different Lee Firma books, but above all is the biography. So oh, thank you. I find that. Thank you, Artemis. A huge pleasure. Thanks so much, Oliver. Now, before I go, I thought I would recite to you a letter sent by Paddy to one of his lady friends. It concerns a delicate matter that is so funny I couldn't resist reading it to you. I say, what gloomy tidings about the crabs? Could it be me? I'll tell you why this odd doubt exists. Instead of robust certainty one way or the other, just after arriving back in London from Athens, I was suddenly alerted by what felt like the beginnings of troop movements in the fork, but on scrutiny there was nothing to be seen, not even a scout, a spy, or a dispatch rider. Puzzled, I watched and waited, and soon even the preliminary tramplings died away, so I assumed, as the happy summer days of peace followed each other, that the incident, or the delusive shudder through the chancelleries, was over. While this faint scare was on, knowing that, thanks to lunar tyranny, it wouldn't be from you, I assumed, and please spare my blushes here, that the handover bid must have occurred by dint of a meeting with an old pal in Paris, which, I'm sorry to announce, ended in brief carnal knowledge, more for old lang syne than any more pressing reason. On getting your letter, I made a dash for privacy and thrashed through the undergrowth, but found everything almost eerily calm, fragrant and silent glades that might never have known the invader's tread. The whole thing makes me scratch my head, if I may so put it. But I bet your trouble does come from me, because the crabs of the world seem to fly to me, like the children of Israel to Abraham's bosom, a sort of ambulant Canaan. I've been a real martyr to them. There's some wonderful Italian powder you can get called Mom, which is worth its weight in gold dust. Don't tell anyone about the private fauna. Mum's the word. Thank you and good night. Mm -hmm.